Hi there, I'm Rasheen Levine, Head of UK and European Partnerships for WISE Platform. Welcome to our mini-series, How We're Fixing. I'm delighted to be able to welcome Sarah Holt from Moniz today, who is our guest. Um, we'll be talking to her about the problem that Moniz is fixing for their customers. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on this sweltering hot day at 40 degrees, <laughs> making the mission to our offices. We can't thank you enough. Um, before we jump into any questions, um, can you tell us a little bit about your role, what it entails at Moniz? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Head of Partnerships at Moniz, and that covers a whole range of things from looking at all of the third parties that we bring into the platform that help us deliver services to our customers, through to looking at new kind of growth partners that we can work with to bring more customers to Moniz as well. So awesome. super varied. And I've been following Moniz for ages. They're obviously doing a fantastic job. Tell us a bit more about the actual problem that you're solving, so the kind of customers and what you help them with. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we're um, a mobile money app, effectively, and we're live across Europe in over 31 countries. So really the main mission is trying to make money simple um, and keep money simple for our customers. So if you think about it, um, you know, money can be incredibly complicated. And we find that our customers don't necessarily live super simple lives. So often they're traveling, um, they're moving to different countries for work. Yep. And the way the financial system is set up just doesn't really work for those customers. So our whole kind of ethos and mission has always been about making money as simple as possible for them. Got you. And I, I always understand that was part of the origin story when the kind of company set up and this idea that it's sometimes quite hard to open a bank account if you're new to a place and you don't have let's say much credit history or an address, things like that. Um, notice recently you've launched a feature which is like a credit builder. Talk to us about that. What's the kind of, I guess, the reasoning behind it and what kind of things customers use that for? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you're completely right. The origin story really, our founder and CEO Norris is Estonian. Um, you know, he was a successful business person, moved to the UK, couldn't get a bank account because he didn't have, you know, a utility bill or a proof of address. And yep. it's that classic sort of cycle of, you know, all well, if you don't have an address, you can't get a bank account, you don't have a bank account, you can't get it. You know, all of this stuff, it just, the, the financial system is a little bit broken for yep. people who don't necessarily live the traditional lives of being born in one country and staying in that country working a super traditional job. And the same is true of um, access to things like credit. So, if you move countries, your credit history doesn't come with you. So you could have had a fantastic credit history where you were living before, but you moved to the UK and your credit history is effectively wiped. The same is true if you leave school, for example, and you've never bought anything on credit before. You yeah. have no credit history. So you might want to go and buy a laptop that's, you know, a thousand pounds. You need credit for that, but you can't get access to it because you're basically credit invisible. And I think there's about five million people in the UK who are credit invisible. Wow. And that's exactly what the credit builder service is really designed to help. So trying to improve access to affordable credit so that yep. people don't have to go down the road that, you know, payday lenders and things like this that we don't really want people going down. Um, so effectively, the credit builder is like a savings loan. So customers can choose the amount that they want to repay each month. Um, they repay that amount for a 12-month period that is sort of put away for them in their credit builder account. At the end of the 12 months, they can choose whether to spend, save, invest that money, but they've also all of their repayments have been reported to the three credit agencies, so they've demonstrated their credit worthiness, meaning that they've got much better access to um, more affordable credit at the end of it. Amazing, because I know that just credit history as a general concept can be an absolute kind of enigma to most people, and a lot of people don't realise there's an issue until they kind of want to go and do something, yeah. and suddenly they're stopped and they're very confused by that. So I guess it's kind of demystifying all of that as well, which is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I think in general, you know, financial services can be super confusing. And often, you know, with our customers, they're often operating in um, not the native language. So the Manis app is available to them in 14 languages. Wow. So they can operate immediately in the language that is most comfortable for them. And when you're talking about relatively complex structures like credit, like credit history, it's really important to be comfortable with yep. the sort of the language that you're dealing with. So. Amazing. And I constantly see kind of Manis looking at partnerships and there's loads of integrations going on, often third party apps. Talk to us about then kind of how that fits in, I guess, to the overall mission. So how you use partners to, to kind of, I guess, bring better products, features to the customers. Yeah, I think we've always, We've always thought really carefully about what we build and what we buy because we've got some really good proprietary tech and yep. we've found a way to leverage that. We've got now a platform as a service business that we're helping um, you know, other financial institutions leverage our technology stack to build sort of their digital transformations. But it's, it's always really important that you're sort of focusing on the things that you're really good at and the things yep. that you really need to build versus the things that actually there are other people out there who've already built a great product in that space and there's really no need to reinvent the wheel because one of the things we've really started looking at over the last probably 12 to 18 months is what the opportunity cost is of us building something. It's yeah. not just 
um, you know, the time we'll take. It's what are we not doing while we're building that? If we really need to build it, then we will. But if we don't, then we'll look out there and see who's best in the market for that service. We'll bring them into the platform. Obviously, there's a whole range of stuff that goes with that, making sure that they're trusted, making sure that they're, you know, a good service for our customers. Customers put a lot of trust in us, so it's important yeah. that we kind of value that and make sure that the partners are delivering a really good service. Yeah. Um, but if there are people out there who are doing a great piece of work, we'll leverage that and make the platform stronger. Yeah, sure. and I guess this is the beauty of being a digital player is that you can kind of look at and probably find your way to integrate as much easier than some of the incumbent banks may find. So I think that's a kind of a nice point. But I think also we, we also see that at WISE. I mean, we, for example, uh, international payments is kind of our, our core business. There's lots of other banks and other companies out there where they'll do domestic payments, they'll do other different things, but actually the niche that we can offer and that kind of absolute solution we've worked on for like a decade with our network can kind of be leveraged. And I think there's lots of other fintechs out there that have kind of really honed down on one thing. And if you can kind of just work with them on that, then great, you bring that in, you bring all that experience yeah. without having to have you know, the build costs, like you say, and then kind of the long term, I guess, investment that sometimes comes with doing it all yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, the Credit Builder product is a good example of that because we made a fairly strategic acquisition last year of a company called Trezio, who are now right. part of the Moniz Group, Moniz Credit Limited. Um, but that's really supercharged our ability to deliver a product like the Credit Builder. We've got, you know, the expertise from that team enabling to you know, leverage that and make sure that we can now sort of roll out products and services at a quicker rate than we would have been able to earlier. Amazing. And you, you touched on this kind of idea of a trust with a customer. Do you have to kind of go above and beyond if you're working with a partner or a third party integration in terms of that kind of data privacy piece? Is there anything that you do, I guess, to kind of make sure that everything fits together for your customers at the end of the day? Yeah, we've got a really robust and rigorous process, I think, now. We've got a really good um, inf information security team, brilliant data protection officer. We work really closely, actually, as a sort of um, tripartite, I guess, in terms yeah. of making sure that every partner that we're bringing on, we've put them through a really quite rigorous for our size and stage information security process, sort of being pragmatic, but making sure that you know we're not risking anything from either our customer's data perspective or the integrity of the platform, because obviously that's really paramount as well. Um, so yeah, it's a, sometimes going through that process at the beginning can feel like a relatively painful thing to do, but yep. it's just super necessary to make sure that we're keeping everything safe. Yeah, and I guess once you have that high bar and you're kind of saying this is the way we onboard things, then ultimately if a, a partner gets that exposure working with Moniz, then it makes sense that they want to kind of move through and ensure that they, they have that and they meet those standards. So it makes yeah. total sense. Um, I'm interested also in, in open bank. I know you use that technology at Moniz. Does that, is that kind of an interesting thing in terms of your relationship between you and the high street banks at all? And I'd love to kind of hear about your thoughts on that. You know, I'm guessing customers, sometimes they will have multiple bank accounts. What about, what's your kind of thoughts on all of this? Yeah, I mean, I think open banking is just an incredible opportunity for customers. And actually, I think the point you made about customer trust is one that's really interesting with open banking adoption because I don't think that there's enough understanding more broadly. Right. Um, out there in the market that, of what open banking is. And it feels a little bit like, you want me to share my yeah. other bank's data? You know, just un customers understanding that this is completely safe, yeah. that it is for their benefit. I think, you know, that opportunity is going to be incredible for allowing customers to have a much better holistic view of their finances. And that's really where I think we'll see the power of it through helping people to manage their money more effectively, helping them to understand how they could be saving money across all this myriad of sort of different accounts with different people that they have. And I think that's where we see the opportunity for us is pulling in additional accounts. You know, it's, it's hard. I think we have a decent rate of customers who have us as their primary account, but traditionally with challenges, you know, they're often a secondary account or an additional account to a sort yeah. of traditional high street bank. So bringing that insight into all of the sort of financial um, sort of goings on of that customer, yep. I think is incredibly useful for the customer to be able to say, look, you're spending all this money in all of these different places. Actually, you could be saving money here. You yeah, could yeah. be doing this better. You know, It's a tricky balance because I think nobody wants to be lectured and nobody wants to be told this is how you should be spending your money. But I think cool. a gentle way of doing it to help customers. Yeah, and I guess money. especially so in a cost of living crisis, I think more than yeah. ever people are kind of maybe more open to is there other tools out there? If I share a bit of information about this is what I'm doing, can I find a way forward that's a little bit more productive than maybe my current kind of solutions? I think maybe this is going to open up, I guess. Yeah, I think so. And for all the people who can't be bothered to do that, right, who can't be bothered to go to yet another kind of platform to, yep. to have that service, actually bringing it into the account that they're using on a daily basis 
is incredibly useful because yep. it's sort of doing it without even, you know, you're almost doing it passively without even thinking about it. And I think everybody's looking for ways to save money now, you know, spend their money more wisely. We've been doing a lot around helping customers. We've done a cashback campaign recently about beating, you know, inflation. Um, we're always looking to find ways to help our customers manage their money. And I think that's that's something that we're going to see a lot more of focus on particularly for us over the coming months makes sense and i guess this idea of like kind of sharing your data to get something back that's maybe more personalized and useful i kind of see as an interesting concept because banks are actually quite trusted generally speaking if you're using them for your kind of you know financial well-being you'll kind of trust that service and it's almost like um people often do this thing where they, they'll share data with an insurance company to get a better deal yeah. but don't always realize that maybe sharing some data could also help you find better tools and services in the financial sector so uh, i think it's an interesting one we'll see how it kind of plays out yeah um but my my kind of interest is also um, with your partnerships and when you look at these integrations and you're thinking about things in your own role is it always from a commercial perspective or how do you weigh up is it sometimes actually just holistically make our product features better and that will then drive customers revenues that kind of thing or you know what, what's the kind of way you think about partnerships I think it's a bit of both and I think you know so I've been at Minis now for three years and I think when I joined there was still a lot of talk around marketplaces and just adding a yeah. ton of partnerships in and that was going to be the thing that was going to drive everybody to profitability and I think that's probably yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. everybody's realized now that that's not really the way it's going to go yeah um, and and I, you know, there's always obviously a commercial element. Things have got to be able to kind of wash their own face. We've got to be able to justify the resource. And, um, you know, I'm sure it's the same at why product resource is particularly yeah. precious. So, you know, when we're looking at something, where do we deploy it? It's got to be something that's going to make sense for us. But it's very rarely a pure um, commercial decision in terms of how much revenue is this partnership going to generate. It yeah. is much more usually... You know, we'll build a business case, but there'll be different objectives for each business case. So it's, look, this partnership is being brought on because we know it's going to drive acquisition or because we know that it's going to be really great from an engagement and retention perspective. And so there'll be slightly different KPIs, but ultimately it is that holistic picture, like you say. Yeah. It's long-term sort of driving you know, sustainable yep. revenue growth and profitability. And I guess ultimately you're listening to your customers. So you're getting that feedback day to day saying, yeah. oh, we'd actually quite like this, or I need a bit of helping hand on this or whatever it might be. And that could drive, I guess, the next kind of partnership. Yeah, exactly. So like our insurance offering is a good example of that, I think, because that's not, you know, definitely not a revenue generating opportunity. Right. It is, uh, you know, coming up again and again in customer research, because we've got a lot of customers who have got you know, portfolio careers, they might work multiple jobs as, as many of us are doing now. It's not the sort of traditional, you know, work life that we, we used to have. But what, you know, that brings incredible flexibility, but also brings a little bit of uncertainty. Yeah. And what was coming up again and again in customer research was, I'm worried about what it, what happens if I'm sick and I can't work? What right. happens if I lose my job and I can't work? Um, so our bills protection insurance was really added to to meet that customer need or that customer concern, really. And that's embedded into our paid plans for the UK customers. So there's a there's an ongoing meeting a customer need. Obviously, hopefully, if it is meeting a customer need and they like it, then they'll stay with us. So yep. it's, you know, it's not an entirely charitable kind no, of no, but concern, but it's there to really deliver long-term customer value. And I think that's, yep. that's where the most successful um, product launches will always get us to. The things where you just view it purely through a revenue lens, if it's not really meeting a customer need, then it's ultimately never going to be a success. Totally agree. And it makes sense. In it. And also, I guess you've, you've added a lot of features over the last few years. The product's obviously a brilliant point. Is there anything you're still sort of thinking as a company, do you know what, we just still need to solve this, or there's maybe this particular thing that we, you know, we can't quite solve ourselves that you think could be the next area for you to concentrate on from a partnership perspective? I think that... Not necessarily from a partnership perspective, actually, but from I think there's a, a lot that we still need to do in credit. So I think yep. Credit Builder is definitely the sort of the first step in the journey for us. It's helping customers to improve their credit scores so that then they can get access to affordable credit, delivering that affordable yep. credit in a way that meets their needs and is is right for them. Um, you know, we're obviously live across Europe, so how do we do that in multiple markets and not just the UK? There's like a ton of work that yep. I think we need to do there. Um, I think getting the product market fit right in all of our European markets as well, because as much as um, you know, we know that customer needs are relatively similar, there are nuances in different markets, so making sure that we're meeting that um, in different markets, I think, is, a, is something that we really need to work on. But for me, I think this helping customers to manage their money more effectively in a really proactive way is yep. something that nobody's really doing 
brilliantly. And I think because we know we've got a set of customers who really need to manage their money carefully, that for me is a is a really big driver that we need to we need to solve. But you know, the the, the wider macro environment is just so unstable at the moment. Yeah. It's kind of difficult to predict what kind of customer needs will be in sort of six, twelve months, but they're definitely the things we're focusing on for now. Makes sense. What a huge challenge basically ahead of yeah. you. But it sounds like there'll be lots of work in that and we'll sort of keep an eye out for anything new that comes uh, in the news as well. Um, thank you so so much for talking to us and it's been brilliant to have you. Um, thank you again and for, for kind of making the journey. Pleasure. Thank you.